again, structural hard disk. In progress. And here's the expertise of a lifetime in management of the TAVR, commercial alignment, redo TAVRs, transcatheter mitral and tricuspid interventions, surgery for failed TAVR and PEER, and 4D uh, ICE, which is intracardiac echocardiography. He serves on the committees of the Heart Valve Collaboratory, the PCR, and literally many, many clinical trials. Very recently, he published uh, the results of the triluminate trial, which I'm sure he will talk to you about, where he was the PI out of Mount Sinai. Um, he's a three-time recipient of the Simon Dack Award from, the J uh, from Jack, you know, Journal of American College of Cardiology. The Simon Dack Award uh, is uh, an award for educational excellence. I mean, I'll be with us in, no Dan, charge. Simon Dack used problem. to be chief of cardiology a long time ago. Um, he's an associate editor of Circulation Cardiovascular Interventions and the member of the AATS, STS, AHA, has published more than 200 articles, lectured and trained many heart teams across the world. Um, and he runs a YouTube channel of his own and has more than 17,000 followers on Twitter and LinkedIn. He's very active on social media, not just posting inflammatory stuff, but seriously discussing novel approaches to complex uh, structural uh, conditions uh, and in conundrums uh, that are held live. So without much further ado, Dr. Tang, welcome and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hirwani, for your kind words. Uh, I definitely try to do anti-inflammatory uh, remarks on, on social media, not uh, the, try to cool the temperature. But uh, actually, it's very timely for this uh, presentation because there were a number of important clinical trials just presented at the Transcatheter Cardiovascular Therapy, or TCT meeting, which is the premier interventional cardiology meeting uh, in the world about this uh, therapy. So without much further ado, I'll show you a couple of cases, but I'll also show you a lot of data. So first of all, set the stage. If you have severe TR based on this uh, seminal paper from Jack Imaging, whether you're symptomatic or asymptomatic, it doesn't matter. Your prognosis <laughs> is poor. Okay, so now the problem is that isolated tricuspid valve surgery in the world actually are remaining quite rare. You can see that here in the United States, for example, out of 1.6 million patients, only 12,000 or so surgical procedures are done. And the reason being that is that most of these patients refer late. And so there are a lot of comorbidities. They already advance in terms of renal dysfunction, in terms of uh, liver dysfunction. They're bad right ventricle. And of course, in surgery, if you have a bad RV, it's your enemy because you'll have acute RV failure and then you know, the rest have a very high mortality risk. And finally, not just that, you can have acute liver failure after cardiopulmonary bypass and surgery. And that, of course, is an independent predictor for mortality. And of course, a lot of these patients actually have previous open heart surgery before, particularly mitral surgery. And so this is a reoperation, not first time operation. Now, that's why there are a lot of transcap technologies being developed to kind of address this unmet clinical need. And so you can see that they are potpourri of devices, but unfortunately, a lot of them has already fallen by the wayside or not moving forward. And the reason being is that this population is very heterogeneous. You have a patient with isolated TL, you have a patient with secondary TL due to left side of dysfunction. Uh, of course, you need to have very good imaging uh, in terms of the uh, patients, and then also the anatomy changes from device to device. The clinical endpoints of these trials are harder to define, and I'll tell you in a moment. And finally, if you have bad TL, it still carries a poor prognosis. So here's the idea of uh, the tricuspid anatomy. So you can see that here, the tricuspid valve actually is freely fit valve in general, but it's close to a lot of the critical structure. There's aortic valve here, you can see uh, right up here behind, you can see the right coronary artery, and of course the conduction system. Uh, so you can see that there's a lot of critical structures from a transcatheter valve standpoint. Now here you can see the RV can dilate, and when that happens, the endodilatation takes place at the anterior and posterior junction, and so that's the right ventricular free wall, and you also see the tricuspid annulus also flattens from a saddle to now a plane, and that can worsen the TL. There's now been advancement in looking at TL in terms of severity rather than just three grades. We now expand to five grades, and you can see that here. 
there are patients like that. And of course, if you have wide open TL, we call it tsunami. Okay, so tsunami is a sixth grade. So, um, but also we also understand the tricuspid valve is not actually just three leaflet. There are other segments that actually has relevance in terms of transcatheter intervention, particular repair. So you can see that here you can have three leaflets, but you can actually have four leaflets, and even in the type four, okay, five leaflets, meaning that there are indentations and segments in the other leaflets, and you can see majority of them are either three leaflets or four leaflet morphology. And so you can see that here, if you have more leaflet segments, it's going to be harder to get a good result with tricuspid edge-to-edge -edge, uh, repair. And you can see that here, uh, you can see the residual TL is quite more if you have more leaflet because it's harder to get the edge-to-edge -edge co-optation. So how do you screen these patients on echo? Well, TEE, you have to look at how many leaflets are involved, which leaflets are involved, uh, are the grasping adequate in terms of the length? Is it long enough for the device? Uh, are these levers significantly thickened or tethered? Is there a lead in the way? Where is the jet? What direction of the jet? Uh, is the ventricle horizontal? Because that has an implication on your device manipulation. And then finally, the shadowing of other structures, such as aortic valve, mitral valve, right ventricular lead. So, and eustachian valve itself, even no one talks about it, it's actually relevant in this context because it can impede the device from functioning properly when you try to do your transcatheter repair. So here are some of the basic echo views. I won't bore you to this. This is not an imaging uh, talk, but you can see also we've tried to categorize the difficulty of doing tier, which is transcaptor edge edge repair, which is a, a clip device. For example, in terms of this particular instance, uh, what is easy, which is green, and what is orange or red, which is very difficult. So you have three leaflets. You have long leaflet. You don't have a lot of tethering. If you have small gaps, if you have the co-optation reserve is good, no cords in your way, you don't have a lead, you don't have shadowing, these are going to be more straightforward cases. And you can see that here, just by the gap alone, you can see that this is a, one of the single most important predictor for procedural failure in tricuspid edge edge repair. And you can see that here, you really need to want to get down to moderate TI or better in terms of procedural success to confer longer term outcomes, as you see here, one year uh, mortality or hospitalization. There are other ways to actually help reduce the gap and help you with the procedure. So this is a Columbia uh, case report showing that if you can do a Valsalva maneuver or increase a PEEP to 20 uh, millimeters mercury briefly, you can reduce the gap and make your grasping more easily done. Now imaging has also advanced. You can see that here the 3D multiplanar reconstruction of MPL on TE, you can see that here, can really show you the different planes of the target that you're trying to grasp, as you see in the right upper corner, and you can see on the right side where the clip is now grasping the leaflet, and you can actually see on 3D and also what we call a, tra a transgastric on false view to look at the orientation. So now, expanding to that is now 4D intracardiac echo ice, which has given you a very similar reconstruction of the imaging as you see here. However, you will have the advantage of being inside the heart, so you don't have the shadowing uh, basically artifact from other adjacent structure, which is key to some of the cases we've recently tackled. So in terms of the experience of tricuspid tier, it's still off-label with the mitral clip system. There are no FDA-approved devices right now. The tricuspid G4 device is CE mark in Europe, and the trial has just been presented at ACC and published in New England, and now also in TCT. The Pascal is the Edwards device, a similar device. It's also completed the early feasibility study and now in pivotal trial. So you can see this is a tri-clip system. It's similar to the mitral clip, other than one of the knobs has now changed from the delivery system here to the guide itself to uh, optimize the maneuverability. You still have the four clip sizes to choose from, and I'll just give you a quick example of a 75-year-old male who has previous AVL calf is certainly a challenging re-operation and torrential TL. So one of the views that we see, you can see on the echo lab on these particular patients, is this what we call transgastric short axis view. It tells you how many leaflets the patient has and where the gap is and of course where the jet is located. So you can see now we do a sweep actually of the valve from anterior septal where the aortic valve is located, sweep all the way to the free wall where the posterior septal is located and you can see the jet as well in terms of location and you actually move along as you go across. And this is kind of the view that you would want to use for your grasping. You can see, as I mentioned before, about the 3D MPR. 
and eyes as well. So now here's the device. You can see this is septal and anterior. This is the orientation. And you can do that on eyes as well in terms of optimizing the trajectory. Because the tricuspid levers are thinner, they're going to be harder to see once you try to grasp them when the device is in the RV. So you want to be able to orient everything right from the get-go in the right atrium to avoid getting stuck or getting entangled. And you can see that this is trigastric view is critical to show you where the orientation of the clip arm looks like so you avoid spinning or rotating inadvertently and twisting the valve. So now you can see using ice, you can come up to grasp with the uh, leaflet. You can see the arms very nicely. And you can see now grasp and you can see what it looks like in terms of trying to check when the clip arm is closed. You can do that on MPR as well to kind of confirm the tissue bridge. And of course, you want to make sure on the transgastric short axis view, you have this what we call a double orifice here to make sure the clip is uh, securely inserted in both leaflets. And you also want to check color to see whether you have a satisfactory TR reduction. Of course, you have no TR reduction. You probably did not get any of the leaflets. And finally, ICE is a very good way to confirm because we have situations where on TE it looks promising, but on ICE it actually did not have a grasp because you now don't have any artifacts to actually see the leaflets more clear, very clearly, and you can see that on color as well. So after you deploy the clip, you can see this is the final position. You can see the TL has reduced at least on this side, and the idea is whether you will proceed with another clip to reduce that TL further, and you can see that on ice. And so I'm going to tell you now uh, some data actually related to this, and this is the early feasibility study that I was part of in Mount Sinai, and you can see most of the clips that are being placed are actually in the anterior septal because the trajectory with the device is easier. Also, the imaging is easier. And so we tend to focus on this area to reduce the TL rather than go fishing around in other parts of the valve. And you can see that here, the, what the other most common area is the posterior septal, as you've seen here. Now, and this is the one-year early feasibility result, and you already see that the TL reduction is quite uh, encouraging, you know, 70% moderate or better, and I'll show you uh, in terms of TR1 gray over is 87%. But more importantly, this is the first time we can see that the right atrium and ventricle shrink in size after tricuspid tear, which has not been shown actually in the mitral side for LB and LA. So this is quite remarkable to show that one year sustained remodeling in this early feasibility and also reducing hospitalization. Now, the Europeans, of course, have the device already approved, so they now have the 30-day uh, outcome that was actually published recently in Jack, and you can see that here. Very similar picture, 77% more or better TL. This is an all-comer cohort. You can see the procedure extremely safe. Similar to mitral tear, this is very safe procedure. You can see here, uh, really no one needed open-heart surgery. There's uh, very low mortality. No one has stroke, uh, and so it's a bit, and very... Uh, a nice procedure. Now, Dr. Adams at Mount Sinai here, of course, and Paul Saraja being a national co-PI, recently presented the entire cohort at TCT of the trilumited data. Just to show you what the trial is about is the two arms. is the RCT with the gap less than seven millimeters that randomized between tri-clip or optimal medical therapy at one year, and you're allowed to cross over after one year to the tri-clip, versus some of the more complex anatomy. If you don't think you can get the TR to moderate better, you will go into the single arm. And so these are the clear exclusion criteria. You can see that here, uh, you, can, you have to be on stable medical therapy for 30 days. You have to be at least intermediate or greater risk for surgery. Of course, you cannot enroll in a trial. You have a very poor ejection fraction, severe pulmonary hypertension, over two-thirds systolic, and of course, unsuitable anatomy. So you can see this trial is very rigorous. You have to go for a lot of hoops and actually evaluate by the anatomic eligibility committee, which I was part of, to actually be able to get through to the trial. And now we continue access. We actually treat a lot more patients as compared to when we had the randomized trial. And you can see that this is the initial result. And of course, that has already been published in the New England Journal, and the primary endpoint was met. So now we were talking about the entire randomized cohort, which is around 572 patients being treated. And you can see the picture is actually very similar. So you can see this 88% of moderate or better TL. You can see that at one year. So this is much better than what you've seen before. It's not just 70%. You can see here there's no difference in terms of mortality, 
uh, or hospitalization in terms of the triclip versus the heart failure. But you can see that this is only one year data. We do not expect people with tricuspid valve disease to die in one year. Actually, the curves, if you look at the previous uh, paper that I quoted, actually it doesn't separate to two to five years. So this is still very early to say that whether this is beneficial. But you can see that if you add the quality of life uh, improvement index, this is certainly a win for the patient. Uh, remember, these patients are not just talking about living. They want to have a meaningful quality of life. They don't want to have to go to the bathroom every 20 minutes. Uh, they don't want to have to swell an ankle. So these are actually very important quality of metrics. And so what you see here, for the first time actually, when we had the entire cohort, there was a statistically improvement in terms of six minute walk test, which as you know, is an objective measurement of functional capacity. So this is very encouraging now in this randomized cohort. Now the single arm core is a little bit different. These are, remember, the anatomies that we feel will not be able to reduce to moderate or better TR due to multiple factors, big gaps, uh, leads in the way, you know, multiple leaflets, horizontal heart, you name it. So we can see that here, there are not that many differences between the two cohorts actually in terms of medical <laughs> comorbidities. But of course, you see that the single arm have more pacemaker ventricular leads and of course, more previous aortic valve or mitral valve intervention. Why? Because these patients have shadowing issues with the imaging such that it will be more difficult to see the tricuspid valve. So that's why they go in the single arm rather than the randomized arm. And of course, you can also see that here there are more torrential TL by grade compared to the randomized arm, of course, because and also bigger gaps. You can see here two millimeter difference. I can tell you that two millimeter makes a huge difference whether you can have a straightforward case or difficult case um, because of the device itself and also maneuvering the device. And you can see there are bigger ventricles and bigger atrium as well, so add to the complexity of the procedure. Having said that though, despite that, you know, with our experience, you can see the single arm and the randomized arm did not really have a lot of differences in terms of procedural time. I think imaging played a key and also device comfort has also played a key role. And you can see here again, all zeros pretty much across the board in terms of major adverse event, you know, SLD is on 7.5%, which is basically leave a detachment from the clip, uh, which is not unexpected given, you know, some of the challenging anatomies that we deal with. But you can see there's very little uh, bleed, major bleeding, very low re-intervention, and of course you don't have device thrombosis or pacemaker to worry about. Now, if you look at the pair data, I tell people when you look at echo data in trials, look at pair data, because then you're comparing apples to apples. These are the same patients, being followed up. And you can see that despite being a single arm, you still have 81% moderate or better adjudicated by the core lab at one year versus the randomized arm, which expect, of course, better results. And you can see that here, the single arm patients are sicker, and that's why they have high mortality and high failure hospitalization at one year compared to the randomized cohort, which of course, they're apples to oranges, essentially, as you saw earlier, but still a important metric to look at. Now, KCCK improvement has been talked about a lot in tricuspid trial. You can see that here, certainly a dramatic improvement. There are no differences between the two arms. And having uh, computed with the primary endpoint, the single arm also has met as well. And so the conclusion is that, is that despite more complex anatomy, uh, the triluminate trial, the single arm especially, has shown to have equivalent or similar benefit as the randomized arm. And so what they look at further is the quality of life metrics and health status from Suzanne Arnold. And basically, I'll just, in the interest of time, looking at what they show is that if you have a worse KCCQ at baseline, you have a better delta in terms of improvement. And this is statistically significant. So you can see that here, more than 10 points, you take up a lot of them up more than 20 points. And then, you know, if you start with uh, 60 points and no decline of 10 points, you can see a huge number of patients who benefit with tricuspid clip versus medical therapy alone. And you can see that in the subgroup analysis, all of them favor triclip over medical therapy from a functional status and health outcomes. And you can see that here uh, in terms of the KCCQ changes actually has been associated not just with death, but also high failure hospitalization. So based on this analysis, they report that the baseline ACCQ score with worse health data, actually have the best bang for the buck in terms of most likely to benefit. And I think this is important to make a note uh, in terms of patient selection. And also, 
the change in the KCCQ score is strongly correlated with TR grade reduction, meaning that if you have better TR reduction, you're going to feel better, which makes sense. Because if I have the choice of between moderate or mild TR, I want mild. No one wants to say I want moderate. So that makes sense uh, in terms of these patients. And I would say that these patients, we've seen the clinic fall off. They're clinically impactful. They are so thankful they don't have to wake up in the middle of the night, go into the bathroom, they can sleep better. Uh, they don't feel they are carrying like 10 pound ankle weights every day when they walk upstairs. They tell you the stories that actually uh, matter, I think, in my mind, to the patient themselves. Now, what about the heart itself? Does it change in shape or size? Well, actually, this is very interesting. So a group of these patients actually underwent CT and MRI to look at the chamber dimensions associated with the tricuspid clip intervention versus medical therapy. And you can see that here, first of all, the regurgitation uh, quantification is actually very similar to what they found in core lab. And you can see, obviously, when you do the tricuspid clip, you're going to have less TL volume and fraction than if you just uh, based on medical therapy only. Now, more important, you can see that this, this is the first time showing that in the right side by CT MRI, that you have right ventricular volume reduction if you do triclip versus if you stay on medical therapy. And you can see that here. I mean, I don't need to tell you numbers. Just look at the same patient here. There's no Photoshop here. You can see the video that look at the left side is the baseline. And now one month, not even one year, one month after triclip, look at the ventricle. It's almost back to near normal now. And you can see that actually on echo in addition to CT MRI, and that's a strong correlation. You can see that if you get more TR reduction, you can get a bigger change and improvement in your right ventricular and diastolic volume. And not just that, you can see that here, there's also improvement in blood pulmonary force flow and ejection fraction as well. So I think this is the first time they show that uh, yeah. imaging sub-study that when you fix the tricuspid valve with cutaneous or triclip, you actually be able to not just improve the quality of life, improve TR, yeah, and but also actually improve the right ventricular contraction and dimensions as well. So I think that could have a longer term consequence versus if you leave the TR alone. Hello? Now, Hi, how can I help you? Triclip tri actually is only one device, but also Pascal is the other device as well. And there's a trial that's going on right now. In the yeah, United that was States. last details. Friday. Uh, but you can see this is kind of early experience, and you can see actually I believe you uh, stopped by the other day the and had for KCCQ and six-minute walk test as well. Uh, so, and you can see this is the class 2 TR trial in the United States. Now, what about replacement? Let's say you can't repair the valve for an atomic reason. So, there are now actually two devices in the United States undergoing trial. And also one from China. Okay. That All right. Actually yeah. Now there's no uh, no updates since the last time. You can time. see that here. This is the Intrepid valve, which is a self-expanding valve, dual frame design that is designed for mitral, but better being placed in a tricuspid position. And you can see that here. This is the early experience. There's still in the EFS study, and this is done in the tricuspid position. You can see it's similar to what we've done in the mitral position at Mount Sinai as part of the clinical trial. And you can see that here uh, in terms of the early data. Now, in terms of the other device called from Edwards, uh, they were just presented recently in terms of randomized control trial. And you can see this is a little bit different in design. You have these little feet that actually grasp the leaflets to anchor with three different sizes. And you can see that they're looking at the safety and effectiveness endpoint in six months, only the first 150 patients, just to get a snapshot of what it looks like. And you can see that this will be the overall cohort of 400 patients. Uh, these patients are randomized to medical therapy, as you see here, for up to five years. And of course, the usual exclusion criteria, which I won't go into in detail, but very similar to what we saw in Triluminate. Now, one of the important things about replacement versus repair is that what is the safety here, right? This is a different device. So this is what they look at in terms of the list of events that can happen. And you can see that here in terms of not just looking at the TR reduction, which you expect to be fantastic with replacement, but also looking at the KCCQ score and six minute walk test. And you can see that here compared to medical therapy, uh, not a lot of difference obviously because it's a randomized trial, but you can see unlike the triluminate, which has quite a lot of uh, massive or torrential TR, you actually see here only about 59% uh, of patients, actually here 55% of patients have massive or torrential TR. So by TR severity actually, it's a little bit less than the triluminate patients. And you can see that here, very high AFib stroke and pacemaker. And you can see that here as well. 
Now look at this, of course, when you have replacement, you knock that TL. On the, on the right side of the screen in six months, almost no patient have significant TL, 99% are moderate better. You can see that here compared to up medical therapy and 94% being mild. And of course, you expect them to improve KCCQ as well as you see here at six months. Now, one of the issue with replacement is that it's not as safe as repair. And you can see that high here, 2% have to go for surgery. And also your length of stay is longer, why? Because unlike repair, which you still have residual TR left, you don't have to, you have to pop off your back to protect the right ventricle. When you eliminate the TR, just like the mitral site in low EF, you now have the right ventricle has to struggle to maintain forward flow, and you can actually have potential acute artery failure, or actually they struggle, so you have to keep them in ICU longer, and that's why rather than going home the next day or the day after, you can see the median length of stays four days for these patients. So it's not something that to take lightly. Uh, but most of them do go home, as you see here, 90%. Now, with a bigger device, the uh, replacement of bigger valves, and so bigger device, you can see at the same time, 10%, 11%, major severe bleeding rate, double the rate of actually triclip. And also you can see here major structural complication, which will lead to tamponade, and also pacemaker is a problem. 15% patient needs a pacemaker. In fact, some of these patients require late pacemaker, which is, I think in my mind, for patients with tricuspid valve disease, is not something that I would want on my patient because then you end up an issue with right ventricular pacing, which doesn't help with the right ventricle, right? We learned that already from existing literature. So even though the data I think are encouraging, I think the major adverse event rate, even though it's less than expected, you know, but I think it's still too high in my mind for these patients, as I mentioned before, already sick to start with. Now, what if you can do any of those? Well, actually there's a device out there in Europe and now getting trials in the United States, you just put a valve in the SVC and IVC. Why? Because you can actually reduce the hepatic congestion and the lower extremity edema. At least you actually, you don't fix the TR, you don't fix the right ventricle necessarily, but you actually, you can see that here, it still improves the quality of life because you're less likely to remain swollen and your liver might be less congested, so you're not gonna be having a belly full of fluid. Now, of all these things, surgery at the end of the day, that's the bottom line, right? If you can't do any of the above, can you still do surgery to help the patient? And the answer is yes, as long as they don't have severe comorbidities, such as liver dysfunction or side effect of that like varices. Um, they have to be you know, also suboptimal for transcatheter treatment because now I would say that you would want transcatheter treatment first if you have the ability to do so. Uh, if the liver is really tearing the lead, you're not going to be able to fix anything transcatheter. Uh, most try failed previous surgical repair, are less likely to do that because of anatomy. And finally, you know, other things like endocarditis, rheumatic and congenital disease. So in summary, I think transcaptor, transcaptor valve therapy is really gaining momentum, as you've seen earlier. Some big trials presented this year, calendar year alone. The early results of TIER is promising, as you see, with the right ventricular remodeling. But of course, it's still limited to smaller gaps, lack of lead, and good imaging. Uh, Annealplasty solution, which I did not talk about, is really hard to do, and so really no one has done it. Uh, now, there are some devices that are approved but not abandoned but actually I would say it's more relevant in this population. And finally, replacement may be easier as you see, but we don't know about thrombosis, rate, durability, pacemaker, and also you have to uh, plan in advance and of course with the risk of RV failure. So now what about the tier itself? Because we offer here in Mount Sinai, we actually have continued access. So anyone with tricuspid regurgitation who is suitable for tier can get the device through the clinical trial or we can even do it with the MitraClip device. Uh, we need to screen this carefully, and I think early referral is the key. Optimizing these patients are key to optimize the anatomy. Uh, we really want to get these patients down to moderate or better in terms of functional benefit, as you've seen earlier. And early referral before the RV basically blows out, I think really is important, because then you basically make it very difficult for us to find a way to treat these patients because they're too advanced to, for them to be to, be, to benefit, number one, but also for any transcaptic intervention to help. And so I will leave this with this uh, slide. You can see this is a bubble chart looking at, basically, if you don't treat uh, tricuspid valve disease versus you treat them, and you can see that the uh, 
uh, patients with tricuspid treatment, the one-year mortality clearly are better than those who are untreated in the existing literature. So on that note, I thank you very much for attention and the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Tang. Uh, now opening up for questions. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, uh, excuse my ignorance, but I, uh, I'd always believed that the major cause of tricuspid regurgitation was left heart function. Uh, so are these patients with controlled left heart function and they have then, uh, because of the previous left heart dysfunction, constant um, dilatation that does not remodel? So that's one 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 uh, feature. Yeah, the no, other is the is... question. Actually, they're um, highly heterogeneous populations. So number one are the patients that we commonly see are the ones that you described. They have existing left sided dysfunction. Unfortunately, as you know, uh, they're not controlled, and then you know the backlog causing right sided dysfunction. But we also now recognize increasingly patients with atrial arrhythmias. So there's an entity called atrial secondary TR. That's also similar to atrial secondary MR. That basically they preserve ejection fraction, uh, preserve LV function, and preserve RV function, but they have a very dilated right atrium and stretch the tricuspid annulus, leading to progressive TL. So that's an entity that we're still trying to understand and are particularly difficult to treat. And then, of course, there are those with pulmonary hypertension, chronic pulmonary hypertension, that lead to progressive RV dilatation and, and dysfunction. So there's still a lot of different patients, but then, of course, finally, the one that we still haven't uh, need to do a better job is to, the ones that are lead associated, right? So if you have a pace patient, there's a pacemaker ICD, and your lead is impinging on the leaflet, you could have TR no matter what. Uh, does an arrhythmia have, have to be treated question? first before you attempt any uh, replacement? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, uh, arrhythmias have to be, do they have to be managed before an attempt at uh, replacement? Great question. It's a chicken and the egg phenomenon. <laughs> I think we usually try to work our EP colleagues to do it, but unfortunately, as you know, most of them have very permanent atrial fibrillation, mm -hmm. which is not really amenable to any kind of ablation or, or antirhythmic uh, therapy. Uh, we wish that they would actually be presented sooner, then we can have a more uh, collaborative and actually a uh, joint approach to these patients. And how about the patients with the pulmonary hypertension as the cause of our, our TR? Are they uh, not candidates? Uh, no, they are candidates. Depends on you know whether they have severe pulmonary hypertension, uh, you know, pre-existing that would preclude them from treatment. Excellent questions, Dr. Brown. Anyone else have questions, Dr. Aqua? Did you have yeah, a question? Actually, mine was to piggyback on the same you know. Um, Thing, uh, of course, our patients are mostly either pulmonary fibrosis, you know, pulmonary hypertension, and they have increased uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. You know? right. So the question is, now that you like do this uh, closer TR, you know, would it make the pulmonary hypertension worse? You know, um, and how, how do you go around that? Well, I think that's why we always tend to write high calf to make sure that the pulmonary hypertension is not fixed and irreversible, and yeah. it's not related to pulmonary causes, right? Yeah. It's actually a cardiac cause. Uh, having said that, there are some patients with a mixed etiology, as you know. Some of them have some degree of pulmonary fibrosis or hypertension from chronic damage, but also have other uh, structural uh, issues, right? So, for example, if primary TR due to a flail cord, you not really fix that as nothing related to the or lead impingement. So, those would I think would benefit from tricuspid intervention. Uh, but those who, who have fixed pulmonary hypertension will advance. Um, we learned that even from the congenital literature that, you know, fixing the TL may not be the right way to go, and you might have to think of other alternative, uh, alternatives. I have a question. The evoke valve, how does it anchor with the lack of a calcific scaffold? Yeah, great question, Dr. Diwani, in terms of how does these replacement devices uh, anchor? So number one, they have to oversize which is actually, unfortunately, counterintuitive for what surgeons do, right? Surgeons, we always downsize the analysts to make the heart strength to force them, but all these replacement devices, which is mitral or tricuspid, the opposite. You have to oversize the angle, it's going to fly out. Right. And so this particular device actually has these feet that I showed earlier that engages the leaflet, so which can make imaging challenging. 
Because if you miss a few of those, you're gonna start, you know, a little bit rocking and not stable in parabolic league. So they say that you have to get at least, you know, you can miss one or two only. So that's where the imaging is, becomes critical. But even then, you know, that that's kind of how they do, it. and that's why not everyone can be treated, uh, big, even with free sizes, because some of them are so big, the analysts, you cannot treat these patients; they're too far gone. So I'm assuming that the embolism valve embolization is less on the right side than the left side because the pressure gradients are lower. Correct, that's right. So uh, that's the, the, the risk of embolization is less, uh, but you still have to uh, make sure that you have sufficient anchor to be able to do that. Uh, and in fact, interestingly, you mentioned that there have been cases where the valve has migrated, uh, not because of the lack of anchoring, but actually because you eliminate the TR now. So what happens? The RV shrinks. So what happens when RV shrinks? It interacts with the valve because now it's hidden against. In fact, there have been anecdotal cases that people put a micro in, the delete list, and now there's inappropriate sensing. Well, why that happens? Because now the RV has shrunk and the lead list is interacting with the metal portion of the valve. So the, the challenge is that we don't know how to predict that and how it's going to remodel. And so you're absolutely right. So that patient will migrate about with no issues. No one even know about it unless you did the echo uh, because there's some changes that they don't know about it that is not necessarily catastrophic. So it would make sense that edge-to-edge -edge repair really is the way to go because you really don't need zero regurgitation. All you need is moderate or lower. That's correct, and that's what we see. Severe and torrential. Right, and also if you see the single arm, the single arm, remember, you're not expected to go down the moderate. But even those patients who have at least one grade reduction has some KCCQ benefit. Um, but from a safety standpoint, I think at the end of the day, you have to discuss with the patient how safe is this procedure. And you don't want, ever want to trace safety from clinical efficacy. And these patients, remember, you don't really have a lot of uh, margin for error. And imagine you replace the valve, yeah, you don't have TR, but now you have these other secondary sequelae that you deal with, the patient is not going to be happy and no one's going to be happy. And now there's no other bailout. Remember, they're not going to go to the operating room to take that valve out mm -hmm. and do a surgical valve in. It's going to be very, very difficult and, and I'm not sure they'll survive the operation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. question? Oh. Any other questions, folks? Any, uh, what a great, now, it's so amazing that we are seeing the dawn really of a new uh, frontier in this management. You know, the appreciation of how much morbidity and mortality is associated and how we can, you know, more effectively take care of it. And, you know, Dr. Tang is literally a pioneer in this. Any other questions, anyone? Thank you, Dr. Tang, for taking the time out of your busy day. Thank you. I know that you had to do an emergency kind of procedure, so thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay. Let's be here. Pleasure.